Welcome to our first Dornsife Dialogue of this new academic year. As you know, the Dornsife Dialogue series provides opportunities to explore contemporary issues with the best experts in the business. But particularly over this past year, so many of these contemporary issues have been pretty bleak. It's not often that we get to hear about what's making people happy or how we can bring more happiness into our own lives. So we wanted to take a break from the news cycle today to look at the study of happiness and some of what has been learned over the years may surprise you. For example, do you imagine that you would be happy living in a place where your days are spent in darkness for half the year, where taxes are twice as high as what you currently pay and where pickled herring is a staple of your diet? In Finland, data suggests that the answer is yes. Along with the other Nordic countries, Finland consistently ranks at the top of the World Happiness Index. And while it is a comparatively expensive place to live, it turns out that it's not necessarily higher income that makes the difference. In fact, as our guest Richard Easterlin has shown through his research, there is real truth to the old saying, money can't buy happiness, at least not over the long term. Professor Easterlin is a university professor of economics emeritus at USC. He is here with us today to talk about his newest book, An Economist's Lessons on Happiness, in which he reflects on what he's discovered over the course of a career that has spanned more than 50 years. Professor Easterlin is an internationally renowned scholar of economic history, economic demography, and subjective well being. And as the very first scholar to specialize in the field, he has been called the father of happiness economics. He is also one of the few people you'll ever meet who has a paradox named after him the Easterlin Paradox. Professor Easterlin will be in conversation today with Professor Maggie Swidick, who earned her master's and PhD in economics at USC Dornsife. Professor Swidick is a manager at the global advisory firm StoneTurn, as well as a USC Dornsife assistant professor of practice of economics. Her research interests include labor, development, and applied microeconomics. And she and Professor Easterlin have published together. I'd like to thank both of them for sharing their insights with us today. And thanks to all of you for joining us. I will now turn the program over to Professor Swidick. Thank you, Dean Miller. And welcome, Dick, uh, to this Darn Side Dialogue. Dick, could you tell us a little bit about your new book? Did you intend this book to be a summary of the knowledge accumulated in the field, or is it more of a personal reflection on economics of happiness? Uh, before I answer, let me say how great it is to see you, Maggie. Uh, <laughs> those of you that are uh, looking on will be able to see a picture of Maggie on page 46 of my book. She's one of the stars. Her research is one of the stars. Uh, and in the picture, she's holding a plaque for excellence in teaching. So this is really a privilege to be talking uh, with Maggie. So uh, the, the motivation for the book uh, was not to sort of survey the field of happiness, uh, but rather uh, to bring together uh, my thoughts on uh, what people really need to know about happiness based on uh, the 50 years now of uh, research uh, that I've been doing, that uh, my colleagues have been doing, including Maggie uh, and uh, others in the field have been doing. So it's directed uh, toward informing people about what they need to know about happiness and how they can increase it. Uh, it's basically what I used to teach in my course uh, at USC on the economics of happiness. Uh, and I think the students generally responded very favorably. And so that encouraged me to write this book. So on that note, Dick, what do economists really mean by happiness? Could you tell us a little bit about that and how it relates to, econ to happiness and maybe philosophy or the literature? Well, uh, you know, uh, a, a, if you go back in the economics literature, you'll find only occasional references uh, to happiness. And it's an attempt by economists uh, to translate uh, a concept in economics, utility, 
into words that mean something uh, to the public. Uh, most of the work on happiness uh, until about 50 years ago or 75 years ago uh, was done entirely by people in the humanities. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, starting around shortly after World War II, uh, the Gallup poll and other pollsters starting asking uh, various questions uh, about how happy people are. And uh, that provided the basis, the data that they've generated provided the basis uh, for the development of a social science study of happiness. So let's backtrack a little bit. Um, so many people here will know you as the father of economics of happiness, but before you got interested in economics of happiness, you were a very accomplished labor economist and economic historian. And so what got you interested in this field, in the field of economics of happiness? Uh, well, I was always interested uh, in uh, the effect of long-term economic growth on people's welfare. Uh, and I was uh, just, uh, it was largely coincidental. I was at the Center for Advanced Study and the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford, uh, where they bring together people from different disciplines. Uh, and there was a sociologist at lunch one day, and we were talking about uh, oh, economic growth and things like that. And he said to me, uh, have you ever looked at the data on happiness? Well, that was the first clue I had that there were any data on happiness. And so I immediately jumped on board and got his input and that of uh, some psychologists that were there about uh, the availability of data on happiness. And that's, that's how uh, that economics of happiness got started. Just coincidental, but a good example of how that center served a very valuable purpose because if I had not uh, had the benefit of that interdisciplinary contact, I would never have gotten into happiness. So speaking precisely of the data and what got you interested, how do economists really measure happiness? So uh, economists tend to favor uh, a single question. Uh, there are several and they all yield quite similar results. Uh, one question is simply to say to people, uh, how happy are you these days? Very happy? pretty happy, not too happy. A more sophisticated question ask uh, uh, in general, how satisfied are you with your life? And people answer that on a scale from zero or one to 10. Uh, a third uh, approach that's favored uh, is what's called the ladder of life approach. In that approach, uh, people are asked to think about the best possible life for them personally, uh, and then the worst person possible life. And then they're presented with a ladder where the re interviewer says, now if zero is the worst possible life for you and 10 is the best possible life, where do you stand on this ladder which has steps, uh, energy, energy values, from zero up to 10. And so, so given that this is all self-reported data, how reliable and valid are these measures really? Well, happily, the, the psychologists have been great at uh, answering those questions. Uh, they've, they've uh, tried, some people think that, you know, it depends on people's moods, the answers. But it turns out uh, if you do what's called a test of reliability, it's a test retest procedure. You ask the same question a day or two later, a week or so later, and see whether those who were happy initially are still the happiest and so on down the line. And they find very high correlation. So the, the answers are really 
people's overall evaluations of their lives, not how they're feeling at the moment. The other uh, issue that they look at is so-called validity is whether people are really telling the truth. And so they test that by asking uh, people's spouses, people's friends, people's relatives, uh, expert uh, uh, clinicians that uh, test the people, how happy they think the person is. And it turns out that the responses individuals are giving about their personal happiness are highly consistent with how other people see that person's happiness. So the answers then are by and large true. People don't lie. They tell us pretty much how they feel, how happy they really are. So I see there's a question coming in from Ulysses that is actually very closely related to what you're talking about. Uh, which is the reliability of and validity of the happiness questions. So Ulises asks, are there cultural differences in terms of the relationship between economics and happiness? And, uh, and in general, in the self-reported data? Uh, that's an excellent question and an important question because uh, the tendency is to assume that yes, there are big cultural differences. It bears on a, a third issue about uh, whether the happiness data are useful, which is whether you can compare the happiness uh, of people, not only in different cultures, but just you and me. I mean, uh, is the happiness uh, of, uh, what, of Joe the same as the happiness of uh, Mike and of Barbara and so on? Uh, the answer to that is uh, interesting. Uh, and, and very important, uh, it's an uh, answer provided by surveys in which uh, people are asked about the sources of their happiness uh, in countries across the face of the earth. Uh, and it turns out that what's important in most people's happiness is much the same. Uh, there are three things that are in the forefront of their answers. One is making a living, two is their family life, and three is health. And those, those answers are so similar, not only in general across a people within a country, but among countries, that it's what makes it reasonable to say, okay, we can compare responses on people people's happiness, not necessarily one person to another, but groups of people to another where any individuals tend, individual uh, variations tend to cancel out and, and the predominant sources of happiness are the ones that are determining the answers, people's making a living, family and health. And so you've been working in this field for many years now. Have your opinions uh, about the economics of happiness changed, evolved over time at all? Uh, what makes people happy? Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, well, as you know, uh, there's what's called the Easterland paradox, which came out of my initial research, and uh, which seemed to say uh, that uh, everything is relative. People uh, are uh, uh, always uh, comparing with others. Uh, and my initial feelings were, well, there's no uh, real policy results here that say this is a good way to increase people's happiness. It looks like they have what a, a psychologist call a set point of happiness that's pretty much constant. Uh, and my view on that changed uh, about 20 years later as a result of reading work by psychologists who said, yes, it's true that there is, people do adapt and uh, the, their happiness uh, often tends to stay the same, but not always. So for example, uh, the, in the literature they would find uh, and in their research, they would find uh, that 
uh, people uh, that had facelifts, for example, were uh, their happiness increased and it stayed higher than it used to be. Uh, and uh, uh, things, people uh, don't adapt to noise. Uh, noise, uh, uh, if they're close to an airport, they always complain about the noise. They don't get used to it. So that made me feel that uh, there were domains of happiness that I had not really looked at very much, uh, where uh, perhaps uh, people did have the opportunity to increase their happiness. And so are those the domains that you discuss in your book or in what way is this evolution in your thinking reflected in your book? Yes, precisely. Those are the domains that I focus on in the book, making a living to which people do tend to uh, have relatively little uh, uh, improvement from changes in their increases in their income. Uh, and changes in family life and changes in health where the uh, effects of improvements in those conditions does raise people's happiness. So uh, there's an important difference among those three domains. Uh, improvements uh, in uh, income have relatively little effect on happiness, whereas uh, improvements in health and family life have sub substantial in impact on people's happiness, positive impact. And so you mentioned the Easterling paradox, and I know this is very closely related to uh, what you were talking about now, what affects and what does not affect happiness. However, for those of you who uh, are not familiar with what the Easterling paradox is, could you explain to everybody what is the Easterling paradox? Uh, sure. Uh, Think there are two types of data that you can think of. One is to look at data at a point in time, and the other is to look at data from time to time. Uh, the first approach is called cross-section analysis, and the second time series analysis. And the paradox is that the data give inconsistent results the cross-section and the time series on whether or not happiness and income are positively related. At a point in time in the cross-section data, those with more income are uh, on average typically happier than those with less income. On the other hand, over time, as incomes of people improve, their happiness does not go up. And that's the paradox. Why it is that you get a different answer in time series than you do in cross-section analysis. So related, very closely related to the time series component, the, the fact that over time, an increase in GDP does not increase happiness. There are some uh, very common questions that people tend to have, especially about that part, not about the cross-sectional, but about the time series. So one of the very common questions that people have is uh, that they find it implausible that over years, over long periods of time, given all the material and technological adv advancements that we have seen, uh, happiness does not increase. So what would you say to a person that would say that, how is it possible that a person nowadays could not be happier given the material and technological advancements that we've had than a person, let's say 30 or 40 or even 50 years ago? Not to mention a century or two centuries ago. Yes, so uh, life expectancy is much better. Health is much better now than it used to be. We live uh, much more, uh, much better than we used to live. So uh, doesn't it follow that we have to be happier than we used than people in the past? So the, the, the question centers really on how people evaluate their happiness, okay? And so uh, today we evaluate 
uh, our well-being, our material well-being, other circumstances, in terms of the conditions that we enjoy today. When we look at the past, we evaluate the past again in terms of the conditions we enjoy today. So we say to ourselves, well, if we had to live like they did back two centuries ago, we'd be much less happy. But the question is, what about the people that lived two centuries ago? How do they evaluate their happiness? And of course, they didn't know about how people were going to live two centuries hence. They evaluated their happiness in terms of the conditions that existed at the time. So the answer to the question about, uh, isn't it necessarily the case that because our objective conditions are so much better, we must be happier? The answer is no, because happiness is a subjective phenomenon. It's how we feel. And how we feel involves the question of how we evaluate our conditions. When we evaluate our conditions today, we evaluate them in terms of conditions today. When we today evaluate conditions in the past, we evaluate them in terms of conditions today. But the people in the past didn't evaluate their conditions in terms of what we enjoy. They evaluated them in terms of what they enjoy. And so there's no reason why happiness in the past and happiness in the present have to increase. And so you mentioned that happiness is subjective and because of that income does not increase it over time. And I know that you touched upon this already, but just to clarify, is everything subjective or are there actually domains of life that are not subjective and therefore can increase happiness? You no, know, everything is subjective, mm -hmm. but uh, people don't necessarily evaluate the different domains uh, in the same way. So the reason why income doesn't raise people's happiness is because people tend to evaluate their income in terms of comparison with others, what's called social comparison. It's a matter of keeping up with the Joneses. And so my income goes up but everybody else's income goes up when the economy is growing. So even though I'm happier because my income is higher, I'm less happy because everybody else's is going up too. So the result is <clears throat> because of social comparison, uh, people fail uh, to enjoy improvements in income uh, as a source of happiness. On the other hand, uh, when I evaluate my health, I don't compare myself with others. I know so little about the health of others. Indeed, you know, the internet uh, uh, has a big deal about privacy of people's medical records and so on. So I evaluate my health in terms of how healthy I used to be. Well, the way uh, health tra trends over the life cycle, I regret to say, is downward. So uh, the uh, tendency when you evaluate with reference to the past uh, in the case of health is to feel that you're uh, getting worse off. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you do something to improve your health, like exercise or diet or things like that, then it's going to make you happier. Uh, and family life is much the same way. Uh, you evaluate it in terms of how things used to be. If you're working uh, and get increasingly distracted from uh, your family and separated, it tends to reduce your happiness. But if you do something to improve your relations with your kids and that spouse and so on, that raises people's happiness. And so 
Let's turn back to income for a moment, because that's what people uh, tend to be <laughs> oftentimes most interested in. Another common question that uh, people have raised is that it is uh, silly to think that rising GDP does not increase happiness, given that we observe that during a depression, when GDP declines just a little bit, happiness collapses. People become very unhappy. And then consequently, as happiness recovers, I mean, rather, as GDP recovers, so does happiness. So the question would be, how can you reconcile this trend with your finding that over a long period of time, as GDP goes up, in happiness does not? Uh, that, that, and that's an excellent question. Uh, so uh, let, let me uh, try to draw a distinction between the short run and the long run. Uh, uh, an example of the distinction would be uh, uh, you're in the doctor's office and the doctor says, uh, how's your weight these days? And you say, oh, well, so much better. I'm uh, five pounds less than I was uh, two months ago. And the doctor looks at the chart and says, yes, but compared to a year ago, you're 10 pounds heavier. The doctor is looking at the long run change and you're looking at the short run change. And that's the issue here. In the short run, happiness goes up and down with income. But in the long run, happiness does not go up with income. And the reason for that is that the way we evaluate uh, income increases is different when we uh, the way we evaluate decreases in income. When income goes up, we're making comparisons with others outside ourselves. When income goes down, we stop making. We I, I shouldn't say we stop. We still compare with others. But what happens is when income goes down, the basis for evaluating our income situation changes to what our previous higher income was. And the reason it changes is because when income goes down, all of a sudden, all of our financial obligations come storming in on us. Uh, uh, payments due on mortgages, on uh, in installment payments, on cars, on uh, appliances, uh, rental uh, 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 contracts, and so on. So uh, the when when income goes down, I may say, sure, I know others' income goes down, but that doesn't make me any happier. What's the problem is that I'm worrying now, as I didn't have to before when income was going up. I'm worrying now about. Uh, how I'm going to meet these contractual financial obligations. And so the more my income goes down, the more I worry and the less happy I become. But as I can, as income starts going back up, the stress of those uh, obligations gradually starts to reduce and happiness increases. So the difference is, uh, and the reason you get a different change in the long run and the short run is because the sources, uh, the way we evaluate our uh, situation shifts. Social comparison dominates when income goes up. Financial hardship dominates when income goes down. And going up, it's worrying about keeping up with the Joneses going down, it's worrying about keeping up with the car payments. So uh, thank you for that. Um, so I want to ask you a few more questions about your book. But before I do that, there have been some really good questions coming in from the audience. So let's okay. turn to those for a moment. Emma asks, has your research examined whether religion has a bearing on happiness? And if not your research, has other research examined? If uh, if religion has a bearing on happiness? Yes, uh, the, the general finding uh, in, in surveys, again, cross-section studies, 
is <laughs> that uh, uh, people uh, who are uh, who attend uh, church or synagogue or uh, mosque, whatever it is, uh, who attend uh, services regularly, uh, tend to be happier than people who do not. Uh, the reasons for that are, are not entirely clear. It's not clear that it has to do with religion versus the support that one gets from being members of a community uh, as you are when you belong to a religion. But the question is uh, whether over time uh, it makes sense to say, well, uh, people ought to get religion in order to get happier. It's not clear that advocating religion uh, is going to promote people's happiness. And so the answer is very similar to that for income. Sure, at a point in time, religion and happiness go together, but it's not clear that it's a way over time to improve people's happiness. And so related to going over time, one person also asks about age differences. And this person is pointing to the U curve um, of the relationship between happiness and age over, over the life cycle. And what they mention is that this U curve shows that older people are more satisfied with their lives than younger people. And his question, his or her question, this is an anonymous question, is uh, that First of all, they say they presume this data is age adjusted. So if you could clarify that. And then they mentioned that the underlying notion behind this, that people would become happier with age, is still very interesting. So could you comment on that? First of all, is the U curve, could you clarify what is the relationship uh, sure. between happiness and so, uh, the life cycle? So uh, we think of a. Uh, 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 a, a graph in which you have on the horizontal axis uh, age 20 uh, running up to age 65 plus. Uh, the, a, a, a graph of happiness in relation to age tends to take a U shape uh, higher at the young ages, higher at the old ages, and hitting a trough around the uh, 40s and 50s. Uh, the, the problem with that graph is that it truncates the population at both ends of the age distribution. Uh, uh, at the earliest uh, ages, it turns out that people tend to be happier uh, in their teens than in their 20s. So the uh, initially happiness declines before, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, happiness declines. And then uh, as your own research shows, it raise, rises as people form families. Uh, and then later in, as people get into their thirties, it goes down. So when you co compress all the data together at the early ages, you lose that early movement of happiness. At older ages, the same problem exists. Uh, the, the U shape is based upon what's true of people ages 65 and over. It doesn't say what's happening to the happiness of people as they age beyond 65 to their 70s, to their 80s, to their 90s. And what turns to happen, of course, is uh, first, you know, there's an upward bump at the 60s as people retire and uh, end their job. Uh, but gradually, uh, as uh, they get older and older, uh, uh, families, uh, 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 partners die. So people become lonely because they're single and health deteriorates. And so, as people move into their 80s and 90s, happiness is declining. So the actual course of 
happiness over the life cycle is much more wave-like than U-shaped. It goes down and up and down and up and down again. <clears throat> so, and the reason for the U-shape is because you compress the age distribution in both the younger and older ages, and you lose those early movements that occur in happiness. So let's turn back to income for just a moment, because as could be expected, we have a lot of questions about that coming in. Uh, Valina is asking if there is a minimum income level where there's a difference in happiness. So when basically uh, whether happiness increases with income up to a point, but then at some point it stops. So is there a magical number that we can all reach to achieve no, the no optimal happiness? There's no magical number. Uh... The, and, and if you look <clears throat> at percentage changes, so you say, what happens to the percentage change? This is in the cross section, understand. What happens to the percentage change in happiness when you have a given, let's say, 10% uh, change in income go, continuing? So you go from, <clears throat> uh, raise income consistently by 10%, what happens to happiness? And the answer is, it tends to go up consistently by the same percentage. There's no break point at which happiness starts to level off. So the, de the relationship between income change and happiness, when they're expressed in percentage terms, is linear. Uh, the increase in happiness and the increase uh, in relation to the increase in income is constant over time. Uh, I'm sorry, not over time in relation to income. So that's what I wanted to clarify that you're talking about the cross-sectional relationship there. Of course, how about, yes. How well, about over oh, time, it's, it's flat. So yes, there's no and, issue about what, what income level changes it. Yes. So to clarify, because I think this is what Valina was asking, at a point in time, it is true that a person of middle income or high level income will be happier than a poor person. However, over time, if you want to increase somebody's happiness, increasing their income is not going to do that. That's, That's the, the paradox. Yes, That's the paradox. exactly. <laughs> um, so. Uh, Oscar is asking, uh, according to your book, we know that happiness and income are not correlated in the long term, which is exactly what we're saying. However, oops, sorry, just one moment. Uh, I'm sorry. Sorry about that, no Oscar. No problem. Okay, it I says, know you've got to read the questions. <laughs> so it says, however, it seems that we follow money in the short term. So in the short term, they are correlated. Do you believe that we have some sort of myopic perspective about how to be happy in the long run that is related to what we think about the short run? Or do you believe that we have some sort of a heuristic that we cannot overcome in our belief that income, increasing income will make us happy? Uh, I, I think uh, the, the heuristic that's involved is social comparison, uh, comparing uh, uh, with others, uh, and uh, certainly in principle, uh, we should have uh, the ability uh, to overcome that tendency to make comparisons with others uh, with regard to income. Uh, so uh, the answer is it's not, the, the relationship is, can be changed uh, through individual volition, uh, but the, uh, changing it is not all that easy. Let me give an example. My daughter, Molly, uh, played soccer, and uh, I, the home we live in, I think most people would say is quite nice. Uh, the soccer coach invited the players and their parents uh, to a get together at his home uh, in order to uh, improve team relationship. And when we went there, it turned out to be like a palace. 
<laughs> and I must say, even though I know I should avoid social comparison, when I got back home, my, my place didn't look quite as good as it used to. <laughs> so that's an example of how difficult it is uh, to, to uh, change that. But it's certainly within the realm of possibility. So if we, if we, let's assume we live in the perfect world where people can change, uh, what could a person learn about how to change or how to adjust their lives to increase their happiness based on reading your book? So if a young person were to read your book today, what would be the giveaway that hopefully they could take for how to become happier? Yes, well, I, I just sort of... Uh, Un undermine the case for uh, avoiding social comparison, uh, <laughs> but that would be one way. But the more, I, I think the, the, the simpler way is uh, we have just so much time uh, and uh, we can allocate it to uh, making money or to our family life or to improving our health. And uh, if we allocate it to making money, we're not likely to improve our happiness. Uh, but if we allocate it to our family life and to our health, we are likely. So uh, the answer is uh, re-shaping uh, your life uh, to spend more time with your family and more time on health uh, will tend to raise your happiness. Uh, that's uh, 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 there. Uh, well, all right. Let me let me go on one minute, a, a minute or two more. Uh, the the thing is, uh, there 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 was a survey uh, conducted that I quote in the book, uh, in which uh, uh, people were said were said suppose. Uh, you were offered a job that uh, would pay 20% uh, more, uh, but it would take you away from home more often uh, and uh, uh, keep you on the road. Uh, what's the likelihood that you would take it? There were four response options, very likely. A third said that, somewhat likely. A third said that. A third said somewhat unlikely. And virtually nobody said, very unlikely. These people had previously said that among the goals in life, their family was most important. And yet, given that option between family life and making money, they were choosing to make money. So that's what I'm arguing in the book. Uh, that's the wrong choice to make. So let's turn back to how we measure the, uh, the question of how happy people are. How do we measure happiness for a moment? I have some interesting questions coming in precisely about that ways of measuring happiness. So Paresh is asking uh, whether instead of relying on survey data to measure happiness, if you think that uh, there may be a merit in analyzing social media data to gauge individual and collective happiness in today's day and age? Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical, although it's becoming uh, rather popular to look at the social media. The, the thing is, when you run the survey, you ask people directly uh, about their happiness. So the responses you get are the responses about how happy they are. The studies of social media or other big data uh, are based upon inferences from the use of certain adjectives, for example, like uh, uh, you know, lively and pleasant and so on. And uh, that's not asking people specifically about their happiness. And you can make different inferences from different sets of adjectives. 
So my feeling is uh, the survey approach uh, where you directly ask people about their happiness is preferable to trying to use a big data approach. So speaking of social media, uh, how about the flip side of it? So how do you think social media has impacted in itself happiness, especially since it allows for more opportunities for social comparison? And this is a question that is coming in from Lilith. Uh, so uh, the, 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 it, it's a question similar to one I look at in the book, whether democracy affects happiness. Uh, and uh, the, the tendency is to assume, oh yes, democracy increases happiness. Uh, in this case, the question is not clear what the answer would be, whether social media affects happiness, but it's a, whether some external circumstance other than those I mentioned is affecting, is likely to have a big impact on happiness. And my answer is, uh, the things that are important are the ones I mentioned. People are thinking about their personal lives, about uh, whether or not they're uh, making a living, uh, how good uh, their family life is, how healthy they are. These are the things they're worrying about. So that I don't, I don't think the political environment or the social environment uh, in the terms of communications uh, plays a, a particularly big role uh, or any role at all in affecting happiness. Let, let me illustrate with reference to democracy because there uh, we have a very good example of whether or not it affects people's happiness. In South Africa, uh, eventually, uh, the black population uh, took over uh, and governed the country in 1995. There are surveys of their happiness before that. And there's a survey uh, at the time that the government, uh, they took control of the government. And the happiness of the black population spikes, shoots up at that point. But a year later, it's back where it was before. That is the chain, the political impact of democracy had a temporary, but not a lasting effect on their happiness. It's an example, the things that were important for their happiness were, were they, was the government doing something uh, to help them make a living and make their life better that way? Uh, was there uh, more health care available? Uh, or was there child care and schooling available for the family? So it was those circumstances that were important for their happiness, not whether, what the political situation was. And I feel the same is true of what is true about social media communications. And so speaking of democracy and the political situation in, the con in, in a country, what can the government, can the government do anything to improve uh, happiness in a country? And if so, what? Yeah, well, the, the answer to that, you, 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 if you look at the data on how happy countries are, uh, you'll find that the Nordic countries, the Scandinavian countries, including Finland, uh, are the happiest countries in the world uh, and uh, their countries that institute welfare state policies. Uh, I know that's not a popular term, but uh, this is what the facts are. Their policies that attend to people's family concerns about their childcare, the care of their elderly parents, the health of everybody, Whereas uh, countries with very high rates of growth, unprecedented rates of growth, uh, China in, uh, in uh, the period from about 1990 to 2015, uh, India in the last couple of decades, 
Japan back toward the end of the 20th century, they had enormously high rates of economic growth, a fourfold multiplication in 20 years. And in none of those countries does happiness increase. And in fact, it tends to decrease. So my answer is, yeah, uh, government safety net policies will, which uh, address the concerns of uh, income, family, and, have, uh, and, and health, uh, which address those concerns, will increase people's happiness, whereas simply raising incomes through economic growth does not. But let me be clear on the income thing. What I'm talking about is being assured of income. Uh, so the, the question is, not so much do I need to have my income go up, but I don't want it to go down. And if I'm thrown out of a job uh, and I have no income support, that's a drastic, has a drastic impact on my happiness. Uh, but if I'm assured uh, of uh, income support until I can find a new job, uh, that tends to eliminate the, that impact on happiness. So income support programs will tend to improve people's uh, or maintain people's happiness as opposed to simply trying to raise people's incomes. So yeah, so the difference there would be between income security as opposed to income growth over time. Good way to put it. Yes. Um, so Susie is asking about the relation between happiness and meaning. And this maybe turns a little bit more into the field of positive psychology. But I know that it's something that people still have many questions about. So Susie asks that she's heard that people uh, often feel more satisfied and more that their life is more meaningful when they give to others. Um, and so what would you have to say about that? What is the relationship between a meaningful life and a happy life? Uh, well, uh, I, I'm sticking with happiness because that's what uh, people uh, are, are, are most interested in. But uh, as regards uh, giving, uh, again, there are cross-section data that, that suggests uh, that happiness and giving are positively related. However, uh, there are, is a study which says, uh, but uh, that, that whole relationship is based upon personality. So if you put in personality along with giving and happiness, giving drops out and personality is what's accounting for the happiness. Of, of people who give. And you can see, you know, you could say, uh, I'm not saying it's not a good thing to give, but I'm saying this is what the evidence is, okay? And, and, you, and you can say to somebody, well, look, the data show that people who give are happier, uh, but uh, maybe I, I, I can't afford to give, or maybe I can't afford to spend the, the time that uh, voluntary work requires and so on. Uh, and so uh, it really, in my mind, is exactly what the studies show that I mentioned. What's involved is like, the, uh, is also true of religion, that personality is what's really driving these relationships, not religion, not giving, not volunteering. And so, I have a question that seems to be related to your comment about Scandinavian countries and the welfare state. Uh, and the person is asking whether there are differences in happiness between more and less heterogeneous countries. And what I wanted to kind of also prompt you to is what I've heard many times is people saying, well, of course, you know, Scandinavian countries, they are happy. They all look the same. They have absolutely no cultural heterogeneity. So that's why they're happy, not because they have a welfare state. So what I wanted you to prompt to it was to talk a little bit about the experience of Costa Rica, a country where people are in fact heterogeneous, but are happy. Uh, 
You already what? gave my answer to that. <laughs> what does Costa Rica have in common with Scandinavia, Dick? Uh, Costa Rica is happier than the United States, uh, and uh, uh, it's happier. It's 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 not quite as happy as the Nordic countries, but it's among the top uh, fifteen. Uh, let me take another uh, country, New, New Zealand, where they have a substantial minority population. New Zealand is like in the top 10 on happiness. Uh, and uh, it's largely because uh, the uh, minority population uh, uh, is uh, the, uh, uh, the beneficiary of a number of policies trying to integrate them and, and benefit them. So the issue is not so much heterogeneity, it's whether what the society is doing uh, to uh, make uh, people generally uh, more uh, better off. Uh, and uh, the, where countries, some countries that are pretty heterogeneous are able to be pretty happy, very happy. And so we only have uh, three minutes left, but I Good. just wanted to- <laughs> I'm getting 10 to the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to leave the last words with you, Dick, just about, uh, before we say goodbye to everybody, if you have any final comments about your book or any final lessons that people could take from reading your book. Uh -huh. Well, so the, the, the lessons of the book I, I, I've already expressed, but let me summarize. I, I think I'm, go, I'm being guided by what people say are the sources of their happiness. And those sources are threefold, uh, making a living, uh, family life and health. Uh, and so uh, my book is saying uh, what we want, the way we want to, uh, operate on our, in our personal lives uh, is to put more emphasis on family life and health rather than income, since raising income does not seem to raise people's happiness. And the book is saying what the government can do is to work on the concerns, the same concerns that people have with regard uh, to their lives, namely, uh, how, what they can do to help raise children, uh, pre-kindergarten uh, provisions, child care, uh, family uh, leave for uh, fathers and mothers. Uh, it's those sorts of things uh, that uh, governments can, can do that will raise people's happiness and the same sorts of things that people themselves can do that will raise their happiness. Thank you, Dick. Thank you so much for agreeing to Thank have this conversation. Patience. And it's, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. And likewise. <laughs> and I also want to thank our wonderful audience. I, we really had a lot of great questions from the audience coming in. They really so were. Thank you. And a shout out to, I saw the names of a lot of my uh, past students. Uh, flying by the screen. I'm sure there were Dick, a lot of your past students also, even some co-workers. So thank you to all for attending and I hope uh, you enjoyed and that you learned something new. My thanks too.